told about Howard Fenster on the show before, but um, it, he, he developed an, an art environment called Paradise Garden. And it's full, it still has a lot of, he died, oh gosh, almost 20 years ago, but but the, the garden is still there. It's still being kept up and events are being held. And um, last year's, uh, in 2020 was canceled and the spring one in 2021 was canceled. And so they're trying again this weekend and it'll be about 60 artists uh, from all over. A lot of them from Georgia. Georgia is kind of a hotbed of that kind of art. And he, his style involves lots and lots of little tiny dots. Um, oh, kind of like kind of, kind of, Yeah. Yeah. But, but much more um, naive than that. You know, oh, okay. And, and and so he'll be there with his and a lot of other artists as well. And so I'm going to take the grandchildren over Saturday so that his wife can go with him to help set up Saturday morning. Um, and, and it's a lot of fun. Uh, there's barbecue to be had. And, um, and they have a little gift shop where you can buy prints and pillows and, you know, stuff that, that they sell. And and um and i'll buy something uh i don't know what but the the last show he had over there i came home with a really pretty pottery bowl uh so it, it'll be a nice and it's supposed to be nice weather it's raining all week but it's supposed to be nice by saturday so i hope it's going to be a pleasant weekend uh over there it'll be a lot so, of fun so, so lee i have to ask does your son know you call him naive well but that's <laughs> Well, no, but that's but that's a legitimate term for art, just like it is for books, and oh. you know that. <laughs> oh, that's good. Yeah, don't give him a hard time. <laughs> I, I couldn't resist. I know. Yeah. No, he, he he can be very sophisticated. He he can. But he's kind of found his niche in this whole art thing, and uh, uh, he you know, enjoys it. You know, that's so it. important for people to yeah. to to find that. I. I will never forget, as long as I live, when we took my grandson to the um, Art Institute in Chicago, and they had been studying um, Surat and yeah. Pontalism in school. And so, of course, they have at the Art Institute in Chicago, they've got the Sunday afternoon at the Grand Jeté, the, yeah. you know, this big piece. Right, right. And I took my grandson in there, and I think he was like 11. And there was a docent speaking and he ran right in and kind of pushed his way to the front <laughs> and he's leaning and his nose couldn't have been more than about an inch or two away from that painting. And that docent was looking like, Oh my God, don't touch it. Don't, don't touch, touch it. Don't touch. You yeah. know, but he soaked in everything she said. And then when she left with her, her tour group, we spent 20 minutes in that room looking at wow. that painting. He ran to the back and looked at it from a distance. And then he ran up close to see how he'd done it with all the dots and then right. back and forth and everything. And and I just think anytime you can expose kids to art and literature and music and stuff like that, it's they'll figure out what they like. And oh, they will. What's important to them they, as they grow up. They will. And both of my sons are collectors of outsider art and uh, of course, Will has had the opportunity to, to exchange pieces with a lot of artists, you know, over the years. And and um, and we have, have really, my house is kind of like an uh, art gallery in some ways. <laughs> well, it really is. Uh, we, we started when my husband took students over to Penville to see Howard Finster. And we became friends with him. And one of our favorite pictures is Will at about two sitting on the ground next to Howard in front of his workshop and they're both waving at the camera and oh he, how neat he has an enlargement of that that he puts in his booth when he does shows uh, so you know they didn't have a chance uh they they like other art as well but this has been a family thing for the last 40 years i guess um, a long time uh, uh, it's been a lot of fun but yes you know we go to art museums anytime there's an opportunity um regardless of what kind of museum it is we have a wonderful western art museum just 20 30 miles from here in cartersville uh, and that's always fun to go to as well 
Well, I have to tell you, one of my my favorite places in New Hampshire, we have a wonderful museum and it has wonderful art. It's called The Courier in Manchester, New Hampshire. But there are a couple other little known gems and one of them is Andre's Institute of Art in Brookline, New Hampshire. And it is an outdoor sculpture garden, but oh. it's not a garden and it's not in the garden in the sense that you would know. It sits on top of a fairly good sized hill in, in, in Brookline. And over the years, matter of fact, I think they're either in the middle of or just have finished their annual sculpturing event where they they bring in four or five sculptures from around the world and they're they're selected each year and uh, and they do a piece of art and it's the they have a quarry, a stone quarry on site so they can they can quarry their own the stone for anybody who wants it. They have the equipment wow. to do it. Oh gosh, that sounds and, great. And they have they have a very large metal fabrication operation there. So if somebody wants to work in metal, they can do metal fabrication. Uh, so these are really, really some very unusual things. And they are, I think they're well over a hundred different sculptures now. Wow. And, oh, gosh, and that would artists, be great to see. They're from all over the world. You name a country. They've probably been there, wow. um, and, and it, it is really you. You can go online. It's Andres Institute of Art in Brookline, New Hampshire, and it's and they got great pictures, photos, etc. Um, you can't, you, uh, and and the scene. I mean, it's it's all outdoors, and the scenery locations are very carefully selected for the pieces. Some you know, so it's really special. Yeah. Well, as much fun as it is to talk about art, I suppose since we're now live, uh, maybe we need to go on with the show. So for all of you who are out there watching, welcome to the Rare Book Cafe, the book lover's rendezvous, where the topics are priceless and the conversation is free. I'm your host, Lee Lynn of the Ridge Books in Calhoun, Georgia. Our, our host, Ed Markowitz, is still traveling in Greece for the next few weeks, but he'll be joining us later with a report from Mycenae. Rare Book Cafe is the only weekly video program on the internet devoted entirely to rare and collectible books and the people who love them. And that's you. We're here every Saturday at 9.30 a.m. Pacific, 12.30 p.m. Eastern, 5.30 p.m. Greenwich Mean Time, streaming on Facebook and YouTube. We're also a podcast, Rare Books Cafe Raw, available on your favorite podcast platform. Joining me today will be two of our regulars, Richard Morey, the Ward Warrior, and Barbara Lowe of Card Teak, reporting on their weekend in Allentown, Pennsylvania, uh, at, the, at that book and paper show. David Hess will be, our, will be with us with our regular segment on things found in old books. And then, of course, Ed will close the show with his report from Greece. Well, Barbara, it looks like you had a long trip. Did you yeah, I drove up and drove back, but... You know, it's worth it because that way I can bring more stuff. <laughs> but, but, I mean, that floor was so that floor was so big. I didn't even see you at the show, Barbara. Yeah, I saw you once or twice as you <laughs> zipped by. You were just going and going and going, and you know, it was, it was kind of crazy. Yeah, yes, he does. Yes, he does. You can never hunt him down in his booth. So, you know. oh, no. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> anyway, it was a lot of fun. It was so good to see people. And that's what everybody was. Yeah, live people. And everybody was commenting. It was great to see all the dealers. It was great to see the customers. A lot of regular customers. What was exciting was there were quite a few new younger people that, you know, said, I never knew what a, you know, book and paper and postcard show was so I thought I'd check it out and this is really cool and you know so of course we love to hear that and uh, you know we do so it was it was a fun show and and Allentown is always interesting because um well and never underestimate how important the farmer's market across the street is for a lot you know? <laughs> exactly but uh for sure but it was it was great to see people and people were buying and um, it was just it was really exciting. So I thought I would show you a couple of the the things that the little treasures that I found. I'm going to start with 
something that I'm always on the lookout for. And that is cards, trade cards that feature African Americans in a non racist way. And, you know, there's tons that have the, the terrible caricatures and, and, you know, the very racist things. But I was really excited that I found a couple that this was one that I was really pleased with. It's for a coffee company. And, you know, here she is and she's uh, working in the kitchen, but it's just a really nice image uh, of um, a black woman. And here's another one. And, um, and so these were exciting. And here's one featuring someone who's doing a photograph of a child. And again, it's, yeah, it's so nice when you can find those. Um, I once had um, somebody come up to me at a show and, um, and he was a white gentleman and he said, you know, I've adopted two um, uh, African-American uh, daughters and um, I would like to see if you have any ephemera that portrays them in a positive way. And I was really happy that I, I had some because, you know, it's important to have that positive representation. Just, yeah, I mean, you know, they, they, they back in the Victorians, they picked on everybody. You know, they picked on the Irish, the Germans, the Chinese, the Blacks and everything. But it's so nice when you can find those ethnic groups that are portrayed in a positive, non-caricature way. So I was really pleased that I found those three cards at the show. And um, so those will go into my stock. And then, I, you, by now you ought to know, I'm the Valentine Queen. <laughs> so I found some more Valentines that were just absolutely wonderful. These are um, old ones that I got. And then I found some movable ones, which are very exciting. And so this, let's see, how am I going to do this? Okay, so we go up and down. And Cupid pulls down the image of the beloved. And it's easier to do when you're not upside down. Um, <laughs> here's another movable one that I found. So what happens when you drink too much brandy? Ooh, not good, not good. <laughs> and then here's another one where we have the image and then it, he unfolds let me get this the right direction there we go and you can see him from behind where it's uh it says your portrait for six dollars <laughs> and it's a donkey <laughs> so those were some things i found now those are things that i i'm going to be selling and will go into my stock but i did want to share something that i bought for my own personal collection I collect um, tickets and uh, invitations and things like that for social events. And I found this, let's see, there we go, which was really a nice piece. And um, it is uh, Daniel Clark, who was the first territorial representative to the U.S. House of Representatives for Orleans. And... Um, it, this is from 1807, and uh, it was an invitation to um, a social event with the Supreme Court, I believe. Um, and so it was just a really interesting piece, and that's for my own collection. <laughs> but it was there was lots of stuff. There was just you know a lot of people, and there were. Um, uh, book dealers, there were ephemera dealers, there were postcard dealers, people specializing in all kinds of stuff. And what was also exciting is there were a lot of new dealers. So um, it was nice to see some new fresh faces on the show floor. Um, what did you think, Rich? Well, I, I want to echo the comment about young people. Um, I think I've mentioned this once before. One of my comments about Brimfield is that 80% of my buying public 
at Brimfield this year was under age 40. And I did, I agree, there were lots of new young faces there this year, which was exciting. And, the, it, and, and that, of course, is our future. Um, and and, it, and it, it was, it was really wonderful to get hugs uh, from old friends and see them. We haven't seen them in years, a couple of years now, catch up on what's been happening and fill each other in. And, and of course, going across the street, um, the highlight of the weekend. <laughs> <laughs> Most of us make too many trips over there, but it's well worth it. It because uh, you can. That farmers market is well known. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, yeah. It, Everybody it, knows about the farmers market across the street. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, this is really great. I should have that near my uh, book show. I'd love something like that. It, uh, <laughs> there so, was a, a that, farmers market it, uh, when we had the Tennessee show in Franklin there was a Saturday morning farmer's market right there at the building where the book show was. It was really, that was really enticing. <laughs> Spend yeah. some time over there. Yeah. It, uh, it, it, this farmer's market is like on steroids. I mean, they cook food, they prepare. I mean, there's, you can get everything from soup to nuts, salads. Yeah, and anything, fresh fruit any, and, you know, you can pick yeah. any specialty food that you want. They've got it. It's, yeah. you know, there's a, there's a great booth that sells chicken pot pies, fresh, hot chicken pot pies. Just, it's incredible. But anyways, too much about the food. I also had the fun time uh, buying it. Uh, and it was really, you know, because every show has got a lot of serendipity to it. Um, I managed to buy a wonderful little collection of signed Tasha Tudor. Uh, I have a couple of the pieces here. This is uh, one of these. I think this one is the first edition uh, of Hold this it up a little title, the, the 23rd Psalm. And um, one is the first edition and one is the later. Both of them signed by Tasha. Uh, these are the little St. Ange books that were published out of Wor Worcester, Massachusetts. Uh, Tasha did two books with him. And these are a little larger than his usual miniatures. Um, but the the color illustrations in these, just to They're show you fabulous. quickly. Uh, I've seen oh, that, yeah. that before. Uh, yeah. 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 This is, it's just, it's gorgeous. Uh, these, in, uh, in a miniature book like this, although this isn't probably technically the miniature size, but it, it passes as a miniature with, with the St. Ange, because uh, that's all he produced was miniature books. Um, but really wonderful pieces. I just, I, I got three copies of that. So that was really good. Plus a whole bunch of other signed books by Tasha. But one of the things actually was quite exciting. I, think I got it right here. Um, what did I do with it? Yeah, here, here it is. Um, this one has a wonderful illustration. This is the only one that had an illustration yeah, it's, let me, let me, it's not that one. I'm sorry. Which one is it now? <laughs> now I can't, I guess it's this. Yep, it's this one. So this one has a wonderful illustration in it. Does it? I, yeah, I think you can see the illustration. Oh, wow. Oh. It's a cat. That is That fabulous. is an illustration. I've never seen Tasha having had drawn a cat. She loves her dogs, especially her corgis, but never a cat. And that one really surprised me. I was tickled to find that. Um, it, uh, and I've handled hundreds and hundreds of her illustrations and books before, so I'm pretty familiar with them. Um, but I love New Hampshire things, and of course, I found some wonderful stuff. One of them is, um, this is um, Colton's. Uh, map of New Hampshire. The original is 1854. This is a later edition, 1875, I think it is. Um, but a wonderful piece, beautiful fold-out map in, inside. Um, but this had a bonus, actually. There was a second map in here, um, which is actually from one of the early White Mountain guides. I think it's a Chisholm's. Um, and somebody had laid it in. So that was unusual to find the two together in this one little booklet. And one of my other favorite New Hampshire um, 
authors I love to buy is uh, Celia Saxter. And I found a beautiful copy of her first book, uh, Among the Isle of Shoals. Uh, and this has a little bonus to it. Um, the dealer I bought this from deals in a lot of art and that work. And this was taken from the estate of Jonathan Sturgis. Uh, his youngest son, uh, Henry Cady Sturgis, um, made a fortune as a wholesale grocer, banker, and railroad executive, and was an early director of the Illinois Central Railroad. So this, this uh, just has a little extra uh, provenance to it, which is nice. And the other, one of my other things, favorite things to buy is Heidi Boys. And as we, as dealers know, the Red Hardy Boys are some of the hardest to find. This happens to be just a brilliantly nice, clean copy. Um, and it, um, always glad to find a, a Red Hardy Boy. Unfortunately, it didn't have a stuff jacket, but they're still extremely difficult to find in that condition. And I have other things, but I could go on and on. Well, it looks like y'all both had a really good good weekend. Well, tell me what kind of things were selling the best. Was there any pattern to what you were selling? Boy, I, Not for me. <laughs> yeah, I sold all kinds of stuff. I sold a lot of um, die cuts. I sold a lot of advertising trade cards. I sold a lot of prints this time, which which was interesting because usually i don't sell that many and i i had five prints that sold so that was exciting yeah. i'm always glad when the big things sell so i don't have to keep right <laughs> <laughs> or when something that you've been lugging around for years and you yeah, have exactly. an opportunity to find a new home for it yeah yeah i had a really wonderful um three dimension set of three-dimensional die cuts that sold and i was really excited um that and and it went to a really good home so i'm really happy that that uh, the person that got it really loved it and you know that always makes you feel good when right. you have something good and and you know it's going to to somebody that really loves it and i had a lot of valentine's sell too so it was a you know all over the place but yeah. that's great because that's what you want to see is you know lots of stuff good that's good yeah i I heard, I heard too. There were a lot of really good finds on the floor. Uh, other dealers who, who discovered things. Uh, a friend of mine found what I think he thinks is a really important painting on sign, but um, attribution seems to be really good. That it's uh, a well-known artist uh, that he bought on the floor. So I mean, there, there's some amazing stuff that shows up at these shows. Yeah. So what do you both have coming up next? Well, my next thing is I'm going to London next ah. month. Yay! Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. And I'm going to be doing two shows over there. So I'm going to be oh, doing exciting. Uh, two ephemera shows. And so I'm really excited about that because that's that's a great opportunity for me to do unique buying that, that people yeah. don't see over here and and uh, selling. And so I'm real excited about that. And then we roll into January for me. What about you, yeah. Richard? Well, Nick, actually in two weeks, I do. I have an annual event I do. I've been doing it for over 20 years. It's a Boy Scout show. Uh, that's one of my areas of specialty. Uh, it's not just Boy Scout books, but Boy Scout ephemera and collectible items and three dimensionals and patches and uh i've got a lot of friends in that world and it's kind of the one time we get together and and uh have a good time and one of the great treats they have a boy scout troop that kind of caters the event and they friday night they serve lobster mm. whoa <laughs> <laughs> Wow. So it, I thought you were going to say they were serving hot dogs. You're right. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I, I don't we, remember any lobster we, at Girl Scout events in, in my I life. Yeah, <laughs> well, this is, well, well, we got a couple guys that know what they're doing and, and hear me. That lobster is some of the best tasting lobster there is. And oh, it's a, wow. It's a fun, they, they, their catering is used as a fundraiser for their troop. We all like to support it. And then after that, I... I'm going to do a show in Syracuse, New York in the middle of November. 
then I'm going on to Columbus, Ohio um, at the, uh, the last weekend of November. Then I'm going to skip down and spend a little time in North Carolina and go the following week, go to Atlanta, Georgia, I think, and do a show in Atlanta and then on to um, to um, Florida. And I'm going to do the um, St. Pete's uh, Sunshine Antique Show at the Coliseum. And um, and I've Which got I a think, whole bunch of Venice's slide up. I think I'm going to be doing as well. Richard's talked me into, into doing that. And tell well, them what you that's great on that. Well, we are we're, what we're going to do is we're going to have a Steve Allman talk to me and we're going to try to do a book roll. We're going to have, I think, probably five days, it looks like, uh, who are going to do that show. It's going to kind of be a mini preview of the Florida Antiquarian Book Fair because uh, I think all the dealers are going to do it and also do the Antiquarian show in, in April. So you'll People will be able to get a, like a preview of what we're going to have at uh, the Antiquarian show in April. So that'll be fun. Yeah, and, and you know, in January we start all over again. You know? We do. We do. <laughs> we just roll through the year again <laughs> and start our taxes and everything. <laughs> oh, let's not talk oh. about yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I'm looking forward to getting back to a schedule <laughs> to be clear. Yeah. Well, I th I think I'll um I think I'll try to come down to Scotts when you're there. Um. Well. And and at least do some shopping. Uh, do a little shopping. Oh, I think it'll um, be fun. Yeah. On the 17th of this month, if y'all saw Mike Glenn last week on our on Rare Book Cafe, uh, he has put together um a stamp exhibit for the Apex Museum in Atlanta of African Americans on stamps. And um, oh. and he invited me to go and a friend and I are going down for the reception on Sunday the 17th. And our That'd art center nice. it, it will be our art center here has been trying to get Roland Hayes on a stamp for years. And I don't know whether there's going to be anyone at the reception who might be of any help or not. But um, I'm going to take some of the material that we've put together here, just in case, you know, just, just in case. But but it'll be a nice a nice little outing. So, um, but anyway, and I'm certainly looking forward to Florida in April so much. Uh, yeah, I, I have a box I started I, too. I, I have a box. I started. see. I say this every time. I am so looking forward to the Antiquarian show in April. It, yeah. um, and matter uh, of fact, I talked to Sarah this afternoon. Oh, did you? Oh, did you? Yeah. Yeah. New baby is doing fine. The, by the oh, way, do you know the new baby's name? No. The new baby's name is Guinevere. Is what? Guinevere. Oh, what my a beer. Oh, that's great. Isn't that, oh, isn't that great? That is. Yeah. Well, we always enjoy having her children at the show so much. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, Quen Quentin and Gracie. Thing. Quentin and Grace are so much fun at the show. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah. And they're getting big. I saw them last um last uh, spring and winter and they're getting Quentin is just growing like a a weed. He's tall as almost as tall as Sarah is now. And oh. Gracie is just a delight. <laughs> Goodness. Well, we saw Grace when she um when she was on with Mike talking about her Nancy Drew books, uh, you know, several weeks yes. ago. When had had not seen her for a while. There's another thing I wish I'd have hung on to. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, Nancy Drew. <laughs> oh, I, yeah. yeah. I had all I, the Nancy Drew books when I was a kid. I, well, I I've heard too. this story. <laughs> Many times. I had a woman come into, matter of fact, in Allentown, I had a woman come into the booth and almost clean my clock on Nancy Drew's. Oh, really? Yeah. All right. She well, took a, she took a stack of them right out, a big stack. Well, yeah, then you were. That's good. <laughs> that, that's good. It that is. Good. Yeah. Well, it's so good to hear good reports from out in the field. And maybe we're getting back to normal. <laughs> that would be oh, great. Oh, wouldn't that be exciting? Wouldn't that be great? Wouldn't that be great? Um, uh, thing, things are still 
not too good here in Calhoun. They're improving, but they're the county, and we're not a very big county, about 50,000. We had 70-something new cases last week, and I think there were seven deaths, which was down from the week before. Mm. But our, wow, that's high. Yeah, it is. It is. But there are a lot of unvaccinated people. I know. Get those vaccines. A lot of unvaccinated people. Yeah. And um, I've been trying to get a booster, but I had Moderna and the only boosters that they're giving here are Pfizer because that's already been approved. Yeah. So, you know, hopefully. Well, I'm, I'm getting my Pfizer booster before I go to London. So well, that's a good idea. Um, but But that's going to the FDA next week. So maybe, you know, maybe things will um things will change fairly soon but anyway yeah. but thank you both for being with us today we look forward always look forward to yes. having both of you and um we'll see you again soon all right thanks all right. good Bye-bye. to catch up i'll be back on the road take okay. care <laughs> bye-bye bye-bye and now joining us will be our regular feature things found in old books by david hess of the bookman in orange california um, and hmm, I think I did know what David had with us today, but I think I have forgotten. So we'll just have to find out while I'll find out while you're finding out. So welcome to today to David Hess. Hello, this is David from the Bookman in Orange, bringing you another broadcast of things found in old books something I enjoy and I like sharing with you. So let's begin. Um, in this book, At Ease by Dwight Eisenhower, I found this little thing here that we'll get a good picture for you. Telerey Programming Guide Models 10 and 1061, April 1979. And what it is, it's a, uh, a little guide on how to program your new computer. It looks pretty techy. Like in 79, you probably needed to know exactly what you were doing uh, to run a computer in those times. And uh, it, you've got the old CRT screens and the little keyboard. And uh, again, this is 79. And uh, it has all kinds of nomenclature in here on on, uh, on setting up your, your this particular brand of computer. Uh, now they don't make this the computer anymore. So I don't know how valuable this would be to anybody now, but I found it uh, pretty fascinating. And uh, you know, I never realized, uh, I don't know if it was a, 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 a home computer or I think it was probably for business or science or, or something like that. I don't think it was like uh, we're looking at cat pictures. Anyway, in this other book here, I've got little markers in there. Uh, it's called The Vagabond Trail by Thomas Dreyer. Uh, it's an old book, and I think what I found inside doesn't match the age. The, the book is 1913. and uh, But inside here, I found again, you know, again with the leaves and the flowers. I, I people press this stuff in in the books, and and uh, I don't know if they ever will get back to it, or they think that they're going to get back to it. But uh, I found a nice little little flower there, and maybe a maybe an oak leaf. It's all stuck inside there. It's been there so long. It's left. Uh, impression on the pages themselves and uh, so you know they went through the trouble of, of pressing this stuff I, I'm glad to share it with with the world now so it's just not gonna be a lost little flower that gave its life to just die in a book and then also a newspaper article again it's been in there so long that it's led the pages uh, it's colored the pages where it's it's sat for years. So this is uh, uh, from the 40s, and I'm not sure exactly when, uh, but it's about this gentleman here, this 
Senator Glass. He's a Democrat, and he's planning a challenge against FDR. So there's more uh, political fighting. It has an article there about his wanting not to be part of FDR's uh, Treasury Department. It's a good little piece of history, and it's just kind of like the things that we read about today, I guess, with the politics and stuff. It just, it's just ongoing, never ends. And uh, a little further back in the same book, I will bring to light a, a little rose, a little rose uh, left in a book. So they, they, they did the double time with, with the flowers. And finally, in the back is another newspaper article. And again, it's been in there so long, it's, it's bled the pages. Uh, but this one is a little different. Uh, it's all, it's dated July 11th, 1935, and it's all in Russian. It's a complete article in Russian. And I've never seen that before. There is a few English words in there. Science and health with key, uh, I can't, key to the scriptures. Hmm, that sounds like Mary Baker Ed. Anyway, on the back is, is actually uh, English. It came from an American paper or an English paper. Uh, but in there, they had a, a complete article written solely in Russian. And as far as I can tell, uh, there's, I, don't, I have no idea what it's about. Uh, well, looking a little further here, it, it, it does say C period, S period monitor. That's the Christian Science Monitor. So there you go. So maybe it's something about Mary Baker Eddy written in Russian. Found that interesting. And finally, this was very special to me. And uh, a little backstory is that when I, about three years ago, I, I had a kind of an injury and I couldn't move around. I spent like three weeks uh, laid up. I couldn't move. And and that time I was in a lot of pain and, and I discovered a, uh, I discovered that 70s show, The Match Game uh, on TV, and I became a Match Game fanboy. <laughs> and I, I know all the trivia, and, and uh, I, I still watch them to this day. I really do. They're on the Game Show Network, and I'll try to catch my, my Match Game. Something about the whole era, the 70s, and the, and the, the production values and stuff. I, I just really get a kick out of watching it. And... Uh, uh, a friend of mine who is also a book uh, scout and, and collector was in our store the other day, and uh, he, he likes to get old paperbacks, and we have a <clears throat> very large paperback section there. And he, he was shopping, and he found this book here, uh, The Damnation of Theron Ware by Harold Frederick. It's an old paperback. I'd never really heard of this title before. Very unusual. But apparently, it's, it's a somewhat of a classic. And he comes up to me and he says, David, I think, I think you're going to like this one. And he hands me this ticket stub. And what it is, it's a ticket to the Match Game 76 with Gene Rayburn and six famous Hollywood stars. Prizes for the audience. It was filmed on Saturday, July 10th, 1976. And there's the ticket. And I went online and I was able to find the episode. It was filmed on uh, July 10, 76, but it showed on August 25th. And so I was able to go and actually watch that show that this ticket had been to. And uh, I was super excited. I love this. So I'm going to like maybe frame it up and put it in my house. I don't know. Uh, I'm weird that way. So. Like I said, I'm a big fanboy of Matt's game, and uh, he was right. I was truly excited to get this one. Uh, thank you, Wade. That's all I have for today, and I want to thank you for joining me. And uh, if you have anything that you would like to share, please contact me at oldbook at ebookman.com. Oldbook at ebookman.com. And I'll be. Uh, more than happy to share it on this particular show. Thank you for tuning in. And this is David from The Bookman saying goodbye for now. We're pleased to have with us again today, Mary Kay Watson, um, our, our resident artist. 
who's going to tell us about how she puts together one of her books of Tangle Shakespeare from start to finish and then share some of her other art with us. And we are so pleased to have her back today. So I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Lee. I'm happy to be here. Um, yeah, I came up with this idea when I did my first book, A Midsummer Night's Dream. And um, what I did is I went and bought copy. It's just copy paper, just cheap copy paper. And it's um, the legal size. Uh, actually, it might be a little bit bigger than legal size. Uh, it's been a few years since I bought this. It's very smooth. And I use tape that um, does not stick. So it's it's um it's scotch tape, but it's the kind that you can peel off again. It it says right on the on the carton that you can peel it off again. And what I do when I do a um when I do a picture, when I paint something, then I send the image to um this freeprints.com and I get get the prints back in photo form. And I tape them into the book. This is Hamlet that I'm working on right now. I tape them in. And the nice thing about it is I've used this book for Midsummer Night's Dream, for Richard III, and I'm using it now for Hamlet. And when I'm done with these, I'll take them out and just store them in a box. Um, I do the same thing with the text. I'll write my text by hand in a, I have a moleskin book that I write my text by hand, and then I type it out in my pages uh, matrix on my Apple computer. And um, then I do a photo of those two. And, you know, they just come in and out easily. That way, if I need to change the format of my book, if I need to change a page around, I can just peel these out. And I've had to do that so many times, just peel a whole bunch out and then, you know, slip something else in. Also, I use um, little post-its for uh, the captions on my on my photos. So I don't even write in this. I just use it to tape the things in. And you can see I, I sewed it together. Um, and it, actually, I did a really good job, I think, sewing it together and gluing it. So it's, but I, I didn't do a hard cover for it. It wasn't necessary. But yeah, so that's, that's my book. And that's how I um that's how I do it for my own um information before I send it online to the printers to be printed and uh, the text which is the hardest part for me because I'm I'm really not an author I'm just an artist um the text I print out and then I edit those sheets and I do a lot of edits um so that is that's about the book. But I get kind of um, stuck in a rut with the book sometimes and I need to be refreshed. And so um, that's when I knit or crochet or do other artwork. And um, I'll show you some of the other artwork that I've been doing. Um, I just finished this and this is um, watercolor paper. It's a, an Italian paper and came off of a block where they're all glued together and you just work on the top sheet and then peel it off. And this is um, pen and ink and um, watercolor pencil. And these are some smaller, some smaller ones that I've done. And you just, and, and those are not mounted on anything stiff. They're just the, just the paper. No, it's, yeah, the watercolor paper. This is, um, these are Zentangle tiles and it's a really heavy, um, I think this is a French paper. Um, it's it's a really good paper. It's very heavy. And um, of course, this is really heavy too. This is um, 140 pound cold pressed, which if anyone who does watercolor, you know, it's it's a heavy paper. Yeah. And it, it has a wee bit of a texture, but not too much texture. This particular brand, this Italian paper, doesn't have much of a texture to it. Um, and that's why I like- I, I love the, the circle. Um, oh, well, thank you. I, I really, that's so, that it, it's so, um, I associate it now with you, the, oh. the circle of form I now associate with you. I have a, um, can I go back and ask a question about your, about your book yes. uh, on your, when you're writing? <clears throat> Do you start with 
the actual Shakespeare's text. Yes. And then edit from from that. What? what yeah. It's it's how, really how hard at the final text, I guess, is what I'm okay. Asking. Well, you know, growing up, um, we didn't learn a lot of Shakespeare in school. And of course, I was really young whenever I started reading Shakespeare. And um, I, I would understand maybe a, a paragraph or a page, um, or maybe a couple pages, I get the gist, but yeah. not, but not every word. Um, so what I'm doing with my book, um, is I'm trying to condense the, the words um, because it's mostly about the pictures. Almost every page is going to have a picture. I even do, um, for the text pages, I do, not, I'm trying to find one of the text pages. For the text pages, I do a border yeah. goes around it. So there's an image on every page. But um, when I do write the text, I try to simplify the language and um, make it easy to understand. It's just spoken language. I explain what's going on in the scene. Um, I, I try not to um, editorialize. I try not to, um, maybe that's not the right word, not to put my own thoughts into it. Uh, with a play like Hamlet, there's just so many, um, oh, Hamlet is this way, Hamlet's that way, you know, there's reasons for the way he acts and everything. And I try not to do that. I just try to simplify Shakespeare's words mm -hmm. so that um, any adult or child who picks up the book can read it and understand what's going on in the story. Right. Well, of course, and, I've, read, and I, I've read your other two, um, and, and they are very easy. You know, I, I bought a Midsummer Night's Dream for my grandchildren because they really love that play. But say with Hamlet, when there are so many um, speeches or lines that are, you know, in the in the public consciousness, sort of, do you yes. try to keep that? Um, sometimes, and I did that with Richard III too. Um, yeah. I, if there were lines that were that we all know, I would actually maybe start the page out with that line. Yeah. Um, or start the chapter out with that line. And I'm trying to do that with Hamlet too, um, because it's familiar. Um, oh. And that's why I'm having trouble. I, you know, I started the scene with the grave diggers, but Shakespeare did such a fabulous job with that scene. And um, so it's really hard to, to simplify that scene because I actually think that when you read Shakespeare's words, it's easy to understand. Well, I mean, that, it's that, very- that is. And you, yeah. um, I don't know, they're, they're just, it, for Hamlet especially, there are so many speeches that, and I guess part of it is because Bob taught it so much and I had to listen to it so much and, <laughs> and you know, and look at student paper, and listen to, actually listen to students spouting out these phrases and, you know, speeches and things that, that, um, that you want to hear that language. And, but sometimes it's really hard to, you know, he uses words and, and references that, that modern readers, you know, who have no familiarity with Shakespeare really don't catch the meaning of. And so I know that's well, exactly. hard to edit. Exactly. Um, one of the best examples is the play Much Ado About Nothing. Mm -hmm. um, in Elizabethan times, nothing was actually talking about the uh, sex and uh, uh, the female sex yeah. and um, so and that's really what that play is about and um, so if you don't know that um, you don't really you don't get that in the but it was double entendre he uses that a lot in his plays and I mean it's just yeah some of the stuff is just so interesting and you want to keep it because he did such a great job with it and that's the grave digger scene um i mean that is just humorous just the way um, right. he wrote it it's it's just so funny but uh yeah i would love to talk to you sometime about um hamlet because uh, <laughs> well it it's a uh, it's a long play <laughs> you've got a lot of material there to cover Yes, it is his longest play, yeah. and um, I think that's part of the reason why it's taking me so long, and and I, I won't say that I get bored with it, but I get weary, 
um, right. working on the same, um, like you said, there's just so much dialogue, there's so many speeches, and I, I, I kind of get weary thinking, because I have, I want to do um, pictures um, for almost every scene. I want it, I want people to be able to pick it up and just look at it and see the pictures and understand what's going on. We'll look forward to whatever you have next. And, um, okay. and, and we'll see you soon. Thanks, Lee. See Thanks you soon. Mm -hmm. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Last week, I went to the Calhoun Gordon County Friends of the Library book sale. That's, I didn't expect to find much in the way of rare collectible books. And I wasn't disappointed there. But I did pick up some things, both for stock for the Ridge Books and um, for my own personal um, own personal use. I prefer for my escapism reading uh, mysteries, and I did get a nice little group of those. And a couple of them turned out to be first editions, so that was good. Um, but I found some nice first editions. All right, this is a picture of the paperback section of the book fair. Uh, there were a lot of those and here is my son my grandson james i took them took james and clara to the book sale after school one day and let them fill a bag with you know dollar books and 50 cent books that was very nice and this um this is the main sale and i have to tell you what this is books of cat various categories are around the edges where you see the little signs those four long stretches of table down in the middle are fiction. And probably 80% of them are mysteries. Some are, are library discards. Some are donated books. Uh, nothing very old. Pretty much everything's fairly new. But at $2 a book for hardbacks and a dollar for paperbacks, you can't beat it. Uh, this is one of the uh sections of um subject books we have biographies there philosophy um i can't read all of these but there were some cookbooks and 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 always always there are a lot of diet books because people buy a lot of diet books and then they don't do much with them <laughs> all of us do that and so there are always a good many diet and nutrition books that turn up at these sales but I did find a few first editions that I was, I'm going to share with you. Um, these are all probably, you know, 10 to $15 books and probably where they'll sell will be on Amazon uh, or perhaps on ABE, but, but one of them, and, and, and these were all in very nice shape. This is the painted drum by Louise Erdrich. 13 moons by Charles Frazier, uh, the sequel to Cold Mountain. My Losing Season by Pat Conroy. And this was published, uh, as probably most of you know, by our bookseller friend Cliff Graubert in Atlanta, well, New York Books. And a nice first of I Am Charlotte Simmons by Tom Wolfe. And since we had just read uh, Robert E. Lee and Me for Book Club, I picked up a book of essays, The Third Day at Gettysburg and Beyond, primarily because it has an essay in here um, called Pickett's Charge, The Convergence of History and Myth in the Southern Past. And I thought that that would be a, a, a good little, um, and I'll have to admit I haven't read it yet, but I hope to read it before the next book club. And, and show it to book club members. And then there were a couple of fun books. Um, you may remember the um, Politically Correct Bedtime Stories books. Well, this was a sequel to it, Once Upon a More Enlightened Time, which is um, uh, uh, fairy tales uh, interpreted in a politically correct manner. And they're very funny. And I love this political Tennessee political humor, and uh, the uh, the blurb says that you know not only is it funny things that Tennessee politicians have had, but sometimes it's the politicians themselves that are funny. So this was a was a fun a fun one to find. 
and there is a B and B and resort up in the northeastern um, Georgia mountains called Glenella Springs. It has it's it was originally built in the late 1900s. It's been there a long time. It's in the National Register of Historic Places. It's only had three families as innkeepers during its history, and the 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 uh, Acock family that restored it in the late 80s. Um, Barry Acock, the wife, did this cookbook um, that's partly history and reminiscences of things at Glenella, but also recipes from the restaurant there. And the, res the restaurant has been very highly regarded in, in by Georgia reviewers for a long time. Um, I, I, it's one of those books that I believe every copy is signed. Um, you know, sometimes you find an unsigned copy of a book and you think, ooh, that's probably a lot rarer than the signed copy. But um, but this is is signed, and I think all of the copies I've had about three or four copies, all of them have been signed. But this was a really nice copy, and I sell a fair number of them. And that was a that was a nice find for um, for my grandson. I had bought a book called The Troubled Village. That's about a village that the townspeople argue about things all the time. They don't agree on anything until the sky falls and the sky is like a big blanket of blue with stars in it and the in the villagers come together to try to put the sky back up where it belongs and they've tried glue and tape and all kinds of things and nothing works and what they finally settled on was that a long pole the pole was not quite long enough to hold the sky up but if someone stood on a ladder and held the pole, they could hold the sky up. And so because of coming together to do that, they quit arguing about things. Now, I can't say that standing on a ladder holding a pole with the sky is a really good way to bring harmony to the village, but uh, but that's what the story in this book is about, and James really liked it. But my, I also bought a couple of Auburn books for an Auburn fan, rabid Auburn fan friend of mine. That I'm going to give her. But I think one of the favorite things that I found, I like cookbooks, I like old cookbooks. Um, this is a book that was put out by the Seventh day Adventist Church called Food, Health, and Efficiency. It's from 1954. And these are vegetarian recipes. Uh, Calhoun and Gordon County, uh, our health center here, our, our hospital, and, and a lot of our doctors are. Adventist, we're trained in Adventist uh, medical schools. Um, we have the headquarters of a, a regional, a region of the church here. We have a, a K through 12 Adventist school here, and 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 you know a, a good a goodly number of um, of members of the uh, Seventh Day Adventist Church here. Um, this 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 book is interesting. Um, they talk a lot about um well because it's, it's it's vegetarian recipes and there's a lot of use of fake meat products some of which don't sound very good i think what's available today is a lot better than what was available in 1954. um and and there's a good bit in here about women staying home and cooking and a lot of these recipes you pretty much have to stay home and cook because there's a lot to do with some of these recipes and and um, and some one thing that's a little bit funny, and I don't, I'm not making fun of the book, but there's a lot of talk about limiting sweets and desserts and things, but there are a lot of dessert recipes. And uh, for example, in the section on school lunches and packing lunches for children or adults, you know, to take with them to school and to work, there's always a dessert included. Um, and and so uh, you know, there's there's. Uh, I think kind of a, and I think this is true in most cookbooks, you know, you can talk a lot about eating healthy, but it's really hard to get away from those good tasting sweets and things like that. Uh, so it's an interesting book. Um, the chapters are, are on, while they have recipes, are on specific um, topics of nutrition. There's one on, there's a, a chapter on protein. And of course, with, with vegetarians, you've got uh, there was a lot of discussion on uses of, of various um, 
uh, you know, plant products that are high in protein. Uh, a lot of milk is recommended. Um, a lot of um, um, cheeses, um, a lot of cottage cheese. But but the, the recipes are interesting. And um, and then there's one on carbohydrates. There's one on minerals. There's one on fats. And there's uh, one on children's nutrition. And then there's the one on on school lunches. Uh, but it's it it. I'd like to see a similar book from a current one than from 1954 to see what changes have occurred in in uh, the vegetarian lifestyle that that the, the church recommends. But it was an interesting book and uh, one that I was very glad to find. The last day of the sale, you can fill a bag for five dollars. And I went back on the last day and I did fill a bag for five dollars. Uh, because one thing I've done with the art center over the years is to do um, candlesticks that are perched on top of a stack of books that I have recovered in marbleized papers and then decorated, you know, with greenery and and stuff like that um, for Christmas. And uh, I had an order for a pair of candlesticks. And so I was able for five dollars to put together the sizes I need and fill a bag with things for that project. So it was a very good, I went three times in three days. And um, uh, I think maybe I spent, oh, maybe a total of $45 altogether. And uh, so it was a, a really a good haul for that. So I enjoyed it. But I have been to book club, book Friends of the Library sales, say in Chattanooga, a wonderful one in Brevard, North Carolina, where there really were deals on on collectible and older books to be had uh, the one in brevard that we went to for a couple of years had a lot of north carolina history uh, north carolina um, uh, botany uh, north carolina hiking trails and things like that and it was really a really a fun show and the um, American Association of University Women's sale in Atlanta every year is like that. In fact, dealers go on Friday night, pay an extra 10 bucks just to go early. And you can really find some nice things at that show. And it's always a lot of fun to go to. So um, library sales and um, organizational sales are a good way to find personal collectibles and to find stock. Uh, and and it, it's always interesting to see what other people are willing to get rid of. So that's another feature. But um, but but it was fun and something that you should keep an eye out for. So I enjoyed that a lot. And I think now we're going to have um, Ed join us from Greece with this week's report. He is in uh, uh, Mycenae. And uh, uh, as usual, he uh, he gives us a nice introduction to the Rare Book Cafe. So, Ed, we're glad to have you with us again today. Hey, everybody. Ed Markowitz, your co-host of the Rare Book Cafe, the book lover's rendezvous, where the topics are priceless and the conversation is free. Here I am continuing my grand tour of the summer of 2021. Today, I find myself at two UNESCO heritage sites, the primary purpose for most of my travels for the next few weeks, visiting locations in Greece and Italy and the Balkans that are considered some of the prime historical spots in the world. Today, right now, I'm at the Acropolis of Tyrrhenius along the northern coast of Nephthali. And in a few moments, you'll see a few videos from Mykenae, the home of the legendary King Agamemnon who was the commander of the forces that attacked Troy. As we begin to pan around this site, you can see off into the distance the sea. Today you see the crops, the fields of lemon trees and olive trees and grapevines. Here on this site, where we currently stand, was the Acropolis, the highest point of this little hill, which commanded a view protecting both the city and the site. 
and giving praise to the gods. As we wander around, it looks like nothing more than stone piled upon stone. This site, which was originally built in the 18th century BC, think about that, 3,800 years ago. And then sometime around 300 to 400 BC, a great earthquake occurred and many of the rocks tumbled to the ground, leaving these low walls and foundations. When the Greek historian Polonius surveyed the site in 200 AD, there was nothing left here and nobody living here any longer. Now let's take a quick tour of Mykenae, followed by a short reading of Homer's Iliad. The olive tree was a gift from the goddess Athena to the Greek people. And to this very day, olives are such an important part of the trade from the Mediterranean. Here you can see beneath the palace, the many olive groves that can be found all over Greece. And here we are in the museum adjacent to the archaeological site of Mykonea. And these are some of the actual treasures that were excavated from the site, including this absolutely stunning set of gold jewelry and these warrior swords. Along the wall of the museum, we see pottery which has been excavated from the site. Once again, reminiscent of the ode to a Grecian urn. I hope you can hear me okay. This country has taken the COVID seriously and everyone is required everywhere to wear masks indoors. Treasures, small and large, pottery, beautifully enameled and painted. Necessary for trade, this pottery housed everything from olive oil to honey to grains and cereals. Some were used for lamps others for daily necessities. No one is exactly sure of the entomology of the name Mykenea, but it's believed that it may have come from the word mushroom, which at the time grew plentifully in this area, or from the ornament that adorned the end of a sword. And now here we are, at the stadium of Asclepios in the town of Epidurus, just south of Mykenae. This magnificently preserved stadium was capable of seating 12,000 people, not counting the vendors who sold popcorn, Coke, Get your Cracker Jacks here, get your Cracker Jacks. Since my visits the last couple of days have been through the ruins of the Mycenaean culture, the Mycenaean cities in the northeast corner of the Peloponnese Peninsula, once the grand ownership and grand kingdom of King Agamemnon, I thought it best perhaps to have this reading come from the first ever, as far as we know, epic home piece of literature, of course, that being the Iliad by Homer, written in 786 BC, and actually consisted of two books, the Iliad and the Odyssey. The Iliad being the 10-year war on the city of Troy, the Odyssey being the return of Odysseus back to his homeland and all of the fates that he experienced along the way. The war began when three goddesses were sitting atop Mount Olympus, Aphrodite, Athena, and Hera, 
eating bonbons and ambrosia, trying to decide amongst themselves who was the fairest of them all. Since, of course, no decision could be reached, they asked Paris to decide for him, and he did. Aphrodite won. And as his prize, he was offered the most beautiful women of all of Greece, and he selected Helen, the wife of Menelaus, the sister-in-law of King Agamemnon. And Paris captured Helen, carted her off to Troy, and Agamemnon, in honor of his brother, declared that he must go to receive her. Thus began the Trojan War. As you listen to this version of the Iliad, written by Alexander Pope in 1800, imagine, if you will, as you see the vistas of both the castle and the plain and the ocean. And it's just so easy to visualize what it must have been like there at the foot of the walls of Troy. The armies being ready to engage a single combat is agreed upon between Menelaus and Paris for the determination of the war. Iris is sent to call Helen to behold the fight. She leads her to the walls of Troy where Priam sits with his counselors observing the Grecian leaders on the plain below to whom Helen gives an account of the chief among them. With shouts, the Trojans, rushing from afar, proclaim their motions and provoke the war. So when inclement winters vex the plain, with piercing frost or thick descending rain, to warmer seas the cranes embodied fly, with noise and order through the midway sky. To pygmy nations wounds and death they bring, and all the war descends upon the wing. His bended bow across his shoulders flung, his sword beside him negligently hung. Two pointed spears he shook with gallant grace, and dared the bravest of the Grecian race. As thus with glorious air and proud disdain, he boldly stalked the foremost on the plain. Him Menelaus loved of Mars espies, with heart elated and with joyful eyes. So joys a lion if the branching deer or mountain goat his bulky prize appear. Eager he seizes and devours the slain, pressed by bold youths and the baying dogs in vain. Thus fond of vengeance with a furious bound, in clanging arms he leaps upon the ground. From his high chariot, him approaching near, the beauteous champion views with marks of fear. Smit with a conscious sense, retires behind and shuns the fate he well deserved to find. As when some shepherd from the rustling trees shot forth a view, scarcely serpent sees. Trembling and pale, he starts with wild affright and all confused precipitates his flight. So from the king the shining warrior flies, and plunged amid the thickest Trojan lies. Thank you, Ed. Uh, that was instructive and fun to see you, and we're so glad you're having such a good trip, and we look forward to your next report. And I think that's all for today. We'll see you again next week, and watch for our preview of this show on Friday at 1230. And then hope you'll be joining us on Saturday, wherever you get your uh, internet, either Facebook or YouTube or on our podcast. Uh, Bye-bye for now. Thank you.